Welcome to Straight Talk Live. My name is Rick Snyder. I'm one of the co-hosts. And Straight Talk Live is a not-for-profit that's really founded upon three major principles around human transformation, digital transformation, and social impact. Those are the things that we care about. Those are the things that we want to help bring and educate and, and really have those conversations out there in the world to inspire influencers like you. So thank you for tuning in today on YouTube, Facebook Live, as well as hearing us on Spotify and, and iTunes uh, for the replays. I also want to introduce our co-host, an amazing leader in his own right, Af Maholtra. Af, take it away. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Thank you, Rick. Much okay. appreciated. <laughs> Very excited to have you all on the show today. And um, I'm the, I'm the co-founder of uh, Growth Enabler, of course, my tech business and uh, the co-creator of straighttalk.live. Today's show is, um, we have a very special gentleman, um, a, a game changer, a inspiring human being, who's going to share some very important facts with us and personal experiences that I think will um, help all of us reconsider our individual potential and our role, the role we have to play to change um, the world and perhaps even create some form of reform or as some people call it um revolution which is uh, which is another um uh, you know ambition for many of us so rick um let's crack on over to you and please introduce our guest today yes i'm very excited about this topic in particular um the role of young people in creating systemic reform and i was just thinking about we you know for youth like i remember back in the day there's these two strong polarities around really having this passion to want to have change happen and getting to see all the blind spots, but then also sometimes falling into apathy where it's like, how is this ever going to change? It's always been like this. And these two polarities that are really always competing against each other. So we have a remarkable leader in his own right, Abdullahi Alim. So Abdullahi, welcome to Straight Talk Live. Thank you for having me, Rick and Af. It's, it's a pleasure to be on. And for our audience members, can you give a brief bio, a brief, a brief background about you, just so everyone can connect, those who, who don't know who you are? Awesome. So my name is Abdullahi. I am based here in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, and I work for the World Economic Forum. And more specifically, I work with our community of global shapers. And that is the World Economic Forum's 10,000-strong uh, community of young leaders in 400 uh, cities around the world. And what I'm currently tasked with is figuring out what a post-COVID economic recovery plan looks like that's centered around young people and frontline workers. And so leveraging the capacity of our young people in 400 cities around the world is really something that I'm doing now. So Abdullahi, first I'd like to start with what personally got you so passionate and involved in uh, youth movements and really making systemic change happen. What was your personal connection to that? Yeah, I think I, I, I often tell people that when you grow up as a minority anywhere in the world, you are very acutely aware of how systems sometimes disadvantage you. I think often a lot of young people from my background go through that phase where you internalize failure and you mm -hmm. think, you know, your situation or your status or your community is of your doing. And then comes that epiphany, I think, when you begin to realize that it's far more entrenched, uh, the circumstances certainly predate you, could potentially outlast you. Uh, but I think that gives you an acute sense and awareness of systems. Mm. And it's certainly the case for minorities like myself who grew up in the West. It's certainly the case for young people who grew up, let's say, in fragile states uh, as well. You're very acutely aware of just how systems at that very macro large level are really the biggest determinant of your life outcomes, not so much your own agency. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate truth, but I think that's the very beginning of my own experience as to knowing how important it is to recognize systems, how they play, and to ultimately know that the most powerful word when it comes to systems is the word power. Mm -hmm. um, systems at the end of the day are manufactured. Um, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're, not, they're not dropped down to us from a higher power as such. It's really manufactured by those who have a vested interest in seeing a particular function or dysfunction. Mm. And so just as they were initially manufactured, they can also be redesigned. And, and that's what I'm passionate about. And so Abdullahi, thank, thank you for that. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? 
Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, before we get into the, the topic, which is so important, and uh, over the last couple of years, thanks to a few young personalities, the popularity um, of young people trying to drive systemic change, create revolutions of sorts, has increased. And the media, the layman or the layperson has become more and more aware of the power, the word you used earlier on, the, of the intrinsic power a young person really has. Whether that be a protest on the streets, whether it would be, you know, um, a commune or a movement or a collective of young people whose voices are actually finally being heard, not just by, you know, local agencies, but actually um, at large by the media. We're at a really important juncture in, in our lives where I think this is the first time I feel young people are empowered to such an extent. And it's a, it's a great feeling. I want to draw this back to a personal uh, aspect of, of, I guess, your journey, which we are not aware of and neither is the audience. We all have a story. We all have some sort of a story that brings us to this point. You know, Rick and I have a story, some, some great parts to it, some traumatic parts to it but it makes us who we are today. And for someone like you who is um, doing something so compelling, what has got you to this point? What, what is really your story? Um, the straight talk is the, is the show, I guess. So tell us a little bit about, peel this onion back for us. Um, tell us about the experiences you've been through. They could be a bunch of trauma, they could be pain, there could be suffering. Also, there could be a lot of joy and, um, you know, uh, filled with ambition and, and positive notes and stories uh, that come from it. What, what's, what's your gig? How did you get here? And we know a lot of people you've impacted, actually, um, positively. What is this X factor of yours? <laughs> we, we want to try and unpack it because your, your, back, your backstory has got a lot to do with, with it, no doubt. So broad question, but please enlighten us with that. Yes. So my family was originally from Somalia. And we moved to Australia when I was six uh, and as, as part of a refugee allocation program. And as soon as we arrived in Australia, I think my, my parents made the decision to enroll us at the Islamic school, at the local Islamic school. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because that was what was most common to them. They, they knew of other Somalis or other, let's say, larger Muslim community that they interacted with. And, and realize that that was the norm. When you travel from one country to the other, the best thing to probably do, and I think it makes intuitive sense, is to try to maintain some kind of familiarity for the, for the youth, but also for the parents uh, too. Sure. And so I had the great luxury in some ways of going through a schooling system uh, of that kind of environment where majority of the students were like me, first generation refugees in Australia. Uh, though I think it, in many ways, shielded the reality of the outside world. Mm. I had no concept mm. of Islamophobia until I went to university. Mm. I had no knowledge of the, just how deeply entrenched issues of race and racism were. I had no idea that we were also of a low income background because the norm on my school was everybody was for the most part from public housing, low income households, um, households of large numbers, 10 myself, for example. So, it was the norm for a very long time. And there was some innocence in assuming that to be normal. Mm. And I think when I went to college and university, and I think especially my second degree, which was at the top school of the area that I, of Australia that I was from, I think that was when I very acutely realized that I was black, that I was Muslim, and that I definitely started from a, from a starting point, which wasn't as advan advantageous as maybe others who are my peer group. Um, and so I think, my, my appreciation for the work that I do right now is it, it really does come from that place of nuance, you know? So I think mm -hmm. if you were to ask me 10 years ago, you know, what are the issues that face you? I could not have given you any answer whatsoever because I wasn't in a position where I had the privilege or the luxury to know of how I was oppressed or mm -hmm. the ways in which structures oppress groups like mine. Mm -hmm. It, it's, 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 it's really, I think, through the literature around systems change and, and, and social justice activism mm -hmm. that I better understood and diagnosed the problems of the world, how they directly mm -hmm. implicate me. And I think 
it, it, it's, it's such a weight off young people's shoulders when they are validated in that way to say, it is not normal to be a young person today and to live through two economic recessions that were both defined as history making. Mm -hmm. So in 2008, it was the largest since the depression. In 2020, we're hearing that exact same language. And in some parts of the world, it was even worse than mm -hmm. the 1920s depression. This is the norm, I think, for most young people today, regardless of whether they come from particularly disadvantaged groups or the norm. And so mm -hmm. it's all, I would say it's almost impossible to get to a point where you work as hard as you do and, and only realize the more you take on a new role, a new ambition, a new goal, fewer and fewer of the people that you started with surround you. Mm -hmm. And I could take that A as a testament to, oh, I'm so great and I'm this, or B, just to realize I'm seriously, seriously the exception, certainly not the norm. Mm -hmm. And that's a pipeline problem. Mm -hmm. and that's a systems problem. And so that's honestly where it comes down uh, for me. So when I'm here in Geneva, when I'm here working for the World Economic Forum, for example, I don't see many people from my background working mm -hmm. here with the same examples. When I travel around the world and I get to see different opportunities, that's not the norm for people like me. So I think in every context, ever, any space that I navigate, it's unfortunately become my new norm, which is mm -hmm. the old norm is absolutely underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's a systemic issue. I'd love to say a lot of that is of my own doing and my own agency. And I did this and I managed to get myself out of, you know, mm -hmm. cycles of poverty and whatnot. Um, I'm really just the exception. And it's an honor for me to use this status as somewhat of an exception to draw attention to the more systemic, which is still undermining more and more people from enjoying more parts of their lives. And, and can I ask you one personal question, please? Yes. Um, you talked about a family of 10, and I guess you have brothers or sisters. Yes. And uh, wherever you sit in the age bracket, the youngest middle. or middle, middle, right, okay. Um, how has your family responded to this? Two parts to my question. One is, of course, their sense of pride and emotion, and we'll tell, tell us a bit more about that. And the second part is, you being where you are, how has that created a positive role model halo effect, hopefully, around just your family members? I don't want to go beyond that. I'm sure you have many people that you've inspired. Tell us a little bit more about that and, and how has that played out for you? Because I find that fascinating um, relating back to... Um, you know, the systemic issues that relate to diversity or inclusion and so on. We've talked about that a lot on, on Straight Talk um, dot Live, but please. So, I mean, without a doubt, my parents are incredibly proud, incredibly, um, <clears throat> they, yeah, they're my biggest champions, I mm -hmm. think. And I think the reality as well is if I did one twentieth of what I've done so far, they would still be incredibly proud. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, that's already a joint itself. I think um, the most joyous experience has just been the reality of having full-time work um, and being able to support your larger family. So I think that's the most direct impact. Mm. And that's one that will always be my biggest success uh, in life. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the ripple effect, I still think it's a process on its own. I do sometimes wonder as the oldest boy uh, of the family and I have three younger brothers, do I, does my success seem distant to them? Or does it seem as close as I would hope it to be? I'm 24 hours by plane away from them. Um, they see me in spaces which to them also seems incredibly foreign. I was mm -hmm. exactly where they were years ago. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they see me as an example or whether they see me as even more distant than, than before is, is, is something that I, I think a lot about, to be honest. Mm. And, and I don't have an answer. You know, I want to go, Abdullahi, to um, even the title of this talk around um, the role of what, what is the role of young people in systemic reform? Um, and what, why I asked that question or what, what's behind it for me is when you mention power, you know, that's something that's always challenging for youth because they're coming into the conversation. Someone's been there before. Other people are holding the power from older generations. Look at the U.S. presidential uh, candidates are in their late 70s, mid to late 70s. And then like a lot of people are saying, hey, it's time for the next generations to get into leadership here. And that's seen all around the world. Um, so what is the role for youth? Um, because there's also social media and things where there's more of a platform for power than there's ever been and shared, um, shared exposure. What are you seeing about that in the role of youth today? 
Um, just very quickly to the question, to the point you made about the presidential debates. Mm -hmm. As a side note, if anybody's listening to this and is in that space of working for debate platforms around the world, please, if you can have an all youth panel mm. holding power to account or an all women panel, I think that does ripples mm. in being able to at least show them in those spaces and maybe one step further, potentially even running in those spaces too. So mm. if ever you are somebody in the periphery <clears throat> of that, I think that would be uh, an awesome thing for us to do. I think social media, of course, is a massive mobilizing tool. Mm -hmm. Do young people have the power to know how to mobilize on social media? Again, probably not, as, mm. as most people might uh, assume otherwise. You require a huge following. Mm -hmm. It requires you to have some degree of capital, social capital in today's world. And I think, again, the examples that we see of the Gretas, the Malalas, the March for Our Lives uh, students, they're not the norm by mm -hmm. any means. Mm -hmm. These, again, are the very, very minute exceptions. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, Afi mentioned the point earlier on, I think more and more young people are, more and more people around the world are being aware, becoming aware of just how much power young people have. I don't think they realize just how powerless they've been for so long and continue mm -hmm. to be. And that being really the driver of the work that they are <clears throat> trying to do. I think in today's world, social media can be a interesting mobilizer of some sorts to connect with peers, to connect with like-minded people to even give you the luxury to understand your, the problems that face you. When you see somebody else articulating in a way which isn't in your immediate periphery, which you can only access from social media, that can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you're still up against uh, structures, I think, in the real world that are very much rooted in this idea of preservation, not change. Mm -hmm. And so then comes that larger question of what then becomes the next step for a group of young people? Because you can raise awareness as much as you can, but... What, what does it take to go from systems that preserve, systems that are dedicated to preserving their traditions to ultimately seeing a shift that's meaningful, not tokenistic, not virtue, virtue signaling, um, mm -hmm. and not one that really just co-ops their advocacy, one that's really, really long-term. And that's the thesis that I'm trying to explore, honestly. Mm. And what, what, it's a big question, and, it's, and you use the right word, it is a thesis or a long investigation process. What have you found so far? Because it's, it's quite a challenging exploration. It's a difficult question. Long term, long term yeah. is a difficult one. What have you discovered so far? Because, of course, we're all seeking that, aren't we? Um, yeah. We're all seeking some sort of a systemic change at different levels uh, as, as part of our relationship with government, relationship with education, relationship with health, relationship with the media. What have you discovered uh, at this stage could be some of the enablers, um, if, if I may, if you are comfortable talking about it. Of course. I, I think the first one, of course, is really just more of the, uh, as, as elementary as it might sound, I think it's the conversation piece on getting young people to realize you are actually structurally disadvantaged in today's world. Mm -hmm. As much as there are you know, youth awards and youth platforms and 30 under 30 this and that, as much as there's an ecosystem designed to celebrate the minorities, within those groups, the very few, when you move beyond that, you are, I think you realize the world structurally disadvantages young people. They do not have much significant access to power. When they do mobilize for change, they are the first groups to be quelled, whether mm. that's the case in the global South uh, or the global North. I mean, I look at, for example, Sunrise in the United States and just the experience of some of the leadership of this youth climate movement. You know, I think their accounts will tell you something very different to, I think, what's typically celebrated about them in the media um, and their own interactions with people in power. I think when you look at the early examples of the Black Lives Matter movement, and I still remember the commentary they gave to media after they had their first meeting with the White House, and I should add a Black president at the time too, and they said they felt completely ignored. They were completely let down by the administration, mm -hmm. completely just sidelined. Mm -hmm. And they were literally at the peripheries of society, I think for a very long time, until we had a series of devastating, devastating killings mm -hmm. this year, which made an audience for the most part at home, not necessarily working as much as they were before, at least outside the home, realize in this 24 hour news cycle that this is a systemic issue. But that wasn't of their own doing. That platform didn't come from their own doing. It really came from an externality. And so, I think when it comes to getting young people to, to, to organize in this way, I think the first part is to actually understand just how structurally disadvantaged they are. 
I think the second one is um, sometimes a missed opportunity in understanding the past. Um, I spoke to a very, very promising young person in the Gaza Strip uh, in Palestine. I think this was a year ago. And she told me the young people who led the union movements of the 1980s in my city are the ones today who lead the big NGOs and who do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because their advocacy was co-opted um, in the late 80s, early 90s. They were afforded by the governments of the time who didn't really want to respond to their rights-based advocacy to say, well, why don't I make you the head of this NGO? Or why don't I give you this particular ministerial role? And so this legacy of being energized, but ultimately either being co-opted or getting to a point where you become so exhausted, overwhelmed, and to a, yeah. a certain point betrayed by your own mm -hmm. naivety that told you that you could actually do change in the very beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that, that psychology, that, that journey of the, of the young change maker, we're not the first generation to experience that. So I wish there was more of that historical appreciation because otherwise we, we risk repeating the same mistakes of either being co-opted or mm -hmm. exhausted. And I think the exhausted one is sometimes even as dangerous because what it often amounts to are older people who then see younger change makers in future generations to come and see their own naivety in them too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, sometimes have a visceral reaction to them. Mm. So the, the, was there a third one as well or was just the two at this point? I, I think maybe the two, the two, the two kind of, uh, points would be, I think, a great starting point. But of course, more to more, we can kind of go through as well. So, if if I if I think about this outside in, the first one is about context, where you're saying you need to understand that you have a certain situation, or it's situational, that you have to accept you are structurally disadvantaged. Now, there are two ways of looking at that. One is someone would say, well, that's a very negative way. Uh, of looking at your position because you're on the back foot. So you're accepting that you're on the back foot. What does that do to your psychology? What does that do to you framing situations and trying to eliminate bias as best possible? That's one way of looking at it. The other is, uh, let's get real, man. You know, let's get real. Um, that is, it is what it is. Let's call a spade a spade. You're in a situation. Now you've got to find a way to get out of that situation. Some would say you're just being a realist. Mm -hmm. Where do you see, um, uh, it's disappointing to hear what you just said about the, the, the young people who were ignored, um, you know, when they were campaigning for the Black Lives Matter piece. But what, what, my, my question, first question is, the first point is structurally disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. What do we what do we do? I mean, young people are going to be on a pathway, but what do the the other side? What should the other side do? What is what is it that you're saying to us or those who are um, not taking young people seriously? I mean, what what would you say? What's your like one minute elevator pitch um, to those who are ignoring young people who think, well, they're great, but they don't know what they're talking about. There's a lot of positive and negative talk about young people. Actually, in fact, just before the show, our team on Straight Talks Live got together, and one of the young people was talking about some of the difficulties they were having around stress management and constantly being on the go and not feeling like it's enough. And they've been dealing that for, with that for years. And we were, we were talking about our youth, not that we're so old, but we're in our early 40s. Um, Rick is just a few years older than I am. <laughs> and, uh, oh, thanks, Af. <laughs> just, just a few years. <laughs> and we were talking about our young age and you know, we were partying and we were ignorant. We were innocent, whatever words you want to use. We were almost blindfolded to the realities of what is going on today. And we just sort of carried on that way. But you guys, this young generation is so informed. You have so much information mm -hmm. and insight. I'm wondering that if that's an enabler or a disabler, sometimes in the grand scheme of things, when you think about um, just living your life with some purpose. But what would you tell us? Um, what, what, what's your story here? I mean, what, what should we do better on the other side? It's, it's certainly an enabler, first and foremost. To, to have access to information, especially when it's honest and, and realistic. Yes, it can be overwhelming at times, but that's not reason to then kind of push the reality to the side. Mm -hmm. I think it definitely comes with its own mental health challenges, most certainly, but that's almost something that needs to be dealt with as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a disadvantage to tell somebody to close one eye and assume that things will get better, because um, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly not the case. Uh, in terms of allies who could potentially provide uh, a huge amount of support, I know, you know, 
our mutual friend Darcy, if I can say. And, and she's on the call, by the way. Yes. Hi, Darcy. Hey, Darcy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, our mutual friends Darcy and Mata at the Academy for Systems mm-hmm. Change in the United States. You know, Darcy in particular had an example where she 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 titled it. Uh, listen to the past, sorry, learn from the past, listen to the future. Mm. Yeah. I think this intergenerational allyship is really the most important thing. And I think it's entirely hinged on both young people realizing that you cannot center your activism on the previous generation has failed me all the time, but also at the same time, getting those who maybe have a little more experience, a little more skin in the game to be able to extend that open hand. Mm-hmm. and share their own experiences mm-hmm. you know and i think mm-hmm. it's it's on both sides to put ego to the to the side to yeah. to yeah. put pride away it's really for a much larger cause that doesn't really specifically mean it's on the shoulders of one generation or the other but mm. I, I i do think it's a case that whoever's in a position where they have an opportunity to showcase this is an example of it um this this platform it would be great if we continue this legacy of showcasing that intergenerational piece mm-hmm. um, and, and that intergenerational allyship, that intergenerational conversation. I think that model really needs to be modeled far more often. Mm-hmm. And I think it can spark greater engagement from both sides of the generational mm-hmm. divide to, yeah. to see their role and to, yeah. and to realize that, you know, to dismiss one generation of the other or to undermine the yeah. value of one of the other doesn't do anyone, but our own ego is good. You know, it's refreshing to hear you say this, Abdullahi, because I don't hear that enough. So often the focus is us versus them, whether you are on the youth side or the experience side, um, and both fingers pointing at each other of blame, right? Um, and so that's so often the, the dialogue that's happening out there in the world. It's so rare to have those intergenerational uh, constructive dialogues where you can put ego to the side and say, hey, how can we actually learn from each other? You have this fresh perspective and are seeing things in a new way. You have this wealth of experience and legacy. How can we take the best of both? And that just does not happen enough in these yeah. conversations. Yeah. The, I, I have another, another question for you, just because you've got such a broad perspective on the shapers community and so on. Mm. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing out there when it comes to... Um, some of the consequences of COVID, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I'll, 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 I'll pull a strand out here, which relates to employment and young people. And what we're starting to see more and more of is younger people um, who are either out of a job by choice or have left the job willingly because they're just not satisfied with what a company gives them or a corporate job gives them. And they feel they have a greater purpose or they feel like they need to... Um, they need to connect with a higher purpose or fulfill their dreams or their, you know, their ambitions and potential and so on. Um, what do you, what, what would you say to the youth listening to this around World Economic Forum or any other platform? It's, it's not a, it's not a sales plug-in or anything, but if I was a young person and I've stepped out of a role, right, in a big company, and I'm like, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something different. What should I do? Can I help you? Can I, because uh, I need to make money too right? I need to make some money and pay the bills. I, I notice some people are going into coaching. Some people are doing gig economy work. If they're like computer scientists, they're doing some development work. Other people are trying to learn new skills and become designers or SEO, web, web developers, so on and so forth. It's a long list. We'll know more about it, of course. Can these people join your revolution or your cause? Are you, is that the group you're looking for? Um, I'm looking for some hope here, really, for them, uh, from, from, from someone like you. What would you, what would you say? I, I love that. I think I, I always think like, yes, even though we have sometimes an impulse to solve things, which is the case for somebody who leaves, I would imagine a corporate job and, and thinks, you know, I am going to find something of a high purpose. But I also think there's value in being able to diagnose. And I think that's something my generation in particular misses repeatedly. And I see that practice show up every single time I engage with young people, which is you know, there's this sudden impulse, sudden urgency, sudden desire to create change. But the issues that you're solving is something you're not systemically aware of. Yeah. And more often than not, what happens is it lends to a social enterprise or, 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 or something to that persuasion that really doesn't do much in terms of tackling the systemic. And not because they yeah. lack the, uh, the platforms and the means to do it. I think even if they had that, it wouldn't really have too much of an impact, too much of a dent. Um, so I, I always say the first thing you can do is really just diagnose, diagnose, diagnose. That's not something you really need to have 
uh, a PhD in necessarily. I think that comes through life and interactions that you have with different people. Yeah. I was very surprised in a conversation I had recently with uh, a young person from the global South, but let's say more of a wealthier background. And the point in which he was telling me he wanted to change the world, but had no understanding of the lived experiences of informal workers, maybe 10 kilometers away from him. Yeah. And that begs the question, where does this impulse to change the world come from? Is that really mm -hmm. just to feed our own anxieties, to quell yeah. our own fears and mm -hmm. to find our own existential desire for meaning and purpose in life? Mm -hmm. Or is it really to change the mm -hmm. world? And if it's really right. the latter, the first mm -hmm. step comes with diagnosing and coming with that humility to understand, learn, 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 learn. And maybe hopefully, just hopefully in life, that might give you the platform to also do something. But I also think it's perfectly within reason to say my legacy was I gave greater understanding of the problem to so mm -hmm. somebody that who's more solution oriented or mm -hmm. has the means and the privilege to be able to resource something of this form to solve it mm -hmm. was able to do it more effectively. That's perfectly fine too. So mm -hmm. I, I'm always looking more for those who are the diagnosers because I honestly don't think the solving mm -hmm. is as hard as sometimes we think it is. Mm -hmm. I also think those who are diagnosers usually have far more humility, far less, um, personal anxieties that are fueling their desire for change. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often think that's the best thing to start with. Diagnose your own desire to create change. Where's that stemming from? Mm -hmm. Also diagnose the issues that surround you because mm -hmm. the world is not, you know, in Africa or in mm -hmm. South Asia or in pockets of Latin America, the world is just as immediate to you as you make it. And so take the, take the time, if you may, to also understand that too. And that mm -hmm. comes through your own interactions. There are millions of documentaries out there that you can yeah. also do that through, but really take stock of that too. And it goes yeah. back to, it goes back to learn from the, learn from the past. Exactly. And mm -hmm. the future. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you're also pulling on a really important thread around leadership is that ability to go meta. You know, how do I go meta to my situation, meta to what's happening as a pattern and, and be able to recognize the larger systemic issues here? I have to have that skill as a leader yeah. to go meta from my personal situation to see that global or even in my, in my community, for example. Great. And so it's a really important skill. And it just has me think about, I saw you on a call recently with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And you were talking about um, that you actually study the science behind uh, movements and what it takes for social justice movements to actually be successful. Yes. And I thought that was so fascinating that you've been like really having your attention and research on that. Please enlighten us a bit on what are some of the things that you've been finding out of what actually makes a movement successful? The first actually relates to what we just discussed, which is that realization to say, you know, as much as I have a desire for change, I am not the first to be awakened to this uh, sensation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many people have had this epiphany before me and many of them have fallen short. And so examining the whys and looking at the context that made that a reality. Is it, is it the stress that it is induced by? Is it the kind of uh, detractors that come your way? Is it the kind of resistance that you come across? There's really a richness to that, which I don't think many of us really appreciate. Mm -hmm. I think in being able to understand our history, mm -hmm. to understand our activism, to study our activism, as mm -hmm. I sometimes call it, you will weed out those before you who have more wisdoms than you can possibly guess you'll be able to find that candidate who ran for office 20 years ago, who may not have won, mm -hmm. but who has insights which could really, really take what you are currently doing to that next level. Mm -hmm. You may come across somebody who was working within a, a given system that you wanted to solve and, and, and left that and is willing to give insights and willing to share that internal information. There are so many potential allies in areas where I don't think many of us can guess even from the very beginning that will begin to emerge and show themselves once you do that. Mm. So I think that's, 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 a, that's the first piece. And I think movements that do that and do that very well are often very successful. I think the second one relates more to, let's say, the, 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 the clarity, if, if I can call it that, of what you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. you know? I think, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of maybe the most important, I think the Me Too movement, for example, is, is a really interesting one. The reason why I cite that is because one of our new shapers actually in Egypt is the lead actually of the, of the movement. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's getting a lot more attention this year. It's taken four years to pick up <laughs> there, but it's, it's certainly getting its, its um, attention too. And I think the reason why it's more successful maybe than let's say other movements that came about in that 2017, 16 period is because 
there was such a clarity of what the issue was and how it prevailed. And I think more and more people were able to contextualize it. So it's, it, it started off as a Hollywood, let's say, mm-hmm. example of right. this is a particular, you know, actress or actor who's experienced mm-hmm. this and this is the perpetrator and the initial mm-hmm. centralizing just that. Then it became very quickly a larger conversation mm-hmm. of workplace harassment. Mm-hmm. And then that became a larger conversation of is the ways that our contracts uh, set up in our workplaces such that it basically defends the perpetrators and makes it impossible mm-hmm. for victims mm-hmm. to get their due course in a public mm-hmm. court, which is the case, unfortunately, with much of the contract in the U.S. at least. Mm-hmm. Um, it sparked such a conversation where people were able to contextualize it, you know, and I think the, from that place, you see the problem as far more immediate than just I saw that Hollywood actress or actor getting a particular uh, experience uh, mm-hmm. put on them that was unfair. And that in itself is also worth, of course, tackling. But the success of the movement mm-hmm. really became when people were able to contextualize it. Here mm-hmm. I am as a worker. <clears throat> Here I am as somebody who is a spouse and the mm-hmm. kind of domestic context in which that shows up. Here's how it shows up in the streets. Here's mm-hmm. how it shows up in the institutions. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is also a really, really important arm when it comes to social justice activism, which is make sure that the direction is clear enough that people are able to contextualize it. Because mm-hmm. I think that ensures people are able to kind of adopt it as their own and not see it as something centralized uh, and kind of distant to them. So I think that's also a really important um, example. And I, I know it's, it's, it's a strange one to cite, but I always think it makes sense in the background for mm-hmm. some central leadership of sorts to be able to build out some form of an alternative. So if it's a governance form that mm-hmm. we think we don't necessarily need, for example, the case in Belarus right now, mm-hmm. uh, right. with a lot of young people, right. some mm-hmm. of whom I've spoken to, who are at the forefront of that, mm-hmm. and who are also having conversations perhaps with um, members of the opposition, maybe those in the, who had to flee and those who are based in the country to see what does the new budget look like, the, the very nitty gritty of a revolution. What does the mm-hmm. uh, Ministry of X do differently than what it was before? Mm-hmm. What are the protocols we're putting in place to combat corruption? Because mm-hmm. what risks happening often, and it happens a lot, unfortunately, is we redress the problem. Mm-hmm. So the problem still exists, but it looks a lot different. Uh, you, you have, let's say, um, I'm going to be as vague as I can here. You, you, you might have a black governor mm-hmm. or a black lieutenant general of a state, but still have uh, unarmed black youth killed and have no mm-hmm. repercussions for the police force, mm-hmm. as was right. the case in one of the states in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, these things are really decorative at best. I have zero interest in celebrating that. Because mm-hmm. I think that's how we perpetuate injustice when we redress it in forms that really allow for it to grow and thrive. Mm. I think the more interesting example is to figure out what does the alternative look like? So if mm. we are to, for example, go from one political party to the <clears> other, <throat> what, what vision are we changing as, as much as just changing the face of, mm-hmm. of who's leading it? So mm-hmm. I think there's also that piece of in the backdrop, building out somewhat of an alternative. And that's a very boring, nitty gritty task. Mm -hmm. It's not Mm -hmm. as sexy as activism that dates back to it. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to, it goes back to the realistic or the, the, the um, realism um, that, that stems from the, the structural disadvantage that you um, have endured or face. And, and, you know, like in business, we talk about when you're building companies or you're an entrepreneur, you one strategy doesn't work that's your ideal strategy it doesn't work you try everything you can and you whack your head on a brick wall you still can't knock a brick or put a crack in the wall and then you you think oh maybe i can walk around it somehow mm-hmm. um and that's got its perils because i think what you said earlier on was quite interesting i registered that clearly where you said uh, i'm paraphrasing what you said there was a group of people who were who had lived experiences who everyone had faith in and over the years they became tops heads of these ngos and now they frankly sort of sitting back like this and saying well i did my bit um and I, it's a bit unfair to judge people i think here and it's it, there's no one's at fault because every person is a catalyst they're a cog and they move the co- they move the system along that's why you need many shapers not one we all have to sort of support one another so um, I have one more question, though, about this concept of lived experiences. I want to get your viewpoints. Um, I'm of the belief, 
I'm of the I've over the years I've started to believe that I respect people who have lived experiences. Mm. Uh, and a really bad analogy of that, just because a lot of business people come onto these calls as well or listen to our shows, is consultants versus practitioners. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of consultancies have all these very smart people with MBAs and PhDs, and I respect them immensely, but they have zero lived experiences, as in they've not been on the front line. You talked about front line, right? Not in the trenches, as we say, versus those who've come from a revolution, who are on the streets of Belarus right now, uh, and many other stories that you've shared. Mm -hmm. what, what's your view as someone who's in the middle of this? Um, do you have that sort of, well, you're an, ac you're the, you provide the academic viewpoint and it's really good, but the guy or the gals who are on the front line, their perspectives are different. Is there any, is it, you know, I'm being politically incorrect. Is there a hierarchy, a perceptive or a bias, unconscious bias here between the lived experience people and those who really think it's intellectually satisfying and really want to do something, but haven't lived it. If that makes sense. I, it does. Yeah. I think to see where whiteness shows up more than anywhere else i think is in the social justice landscape where and i and i don't, and I don't mean whiteness as white people i mean as a system as, as a system where people who have lived experience have a grassroots they're relegated to that position mm -hmm. never really the ones who are the decision makers even just mm -hmm. the distinction that sometimes we make between the content people and the practitioners i mean why can't i as somebody who's lived the issues that i'm tackling and studied it be both mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I could, and I really could do both. And I, and I think of the example of some people on the call who might also be doing both, regardless yeah. of whether they're paid to do it or, or recognized for it um, as well. I think it's a case of putting them at the hierarchy at the very front. Mm -hmm. And for the rest of us sometimes to have the humility to say, how can I support your vision? How can mm -hmm. I support, where, where can I potentially plug in? Not necessarily to say, let me plug myself in because I come from a lived experience that has amps up my value and worth and my ability to solve things. And I'm going to center your experience around it mm -hmm. so that it can be as accurate as a, of a guess um, as possible. I, I really think that's an old power approach. Mm. I think what's more important is for us to center always around people who have the lived experience because they mm -hmm. often do also have content, yeah. whether they have at that journey where they're able to articulate it mm -hmm. in a consultant way is another question. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that skill. Mm. So, so quick question, because you touched on another point that is very clear in Western world. So you have content and you are a practitioner, but you talked about articulation communication. It's a very important part because you take yeah. Mahatma Gandhi, you take Malcolm X, or you take Martin Luther King, whoever it may be, they were orators. Obama, for example, mm -hmm. orators, good communicators. There are people who are not so good at communicating, but have content and have pra practitioner capability. How does that, I mean, you're a fantastic communicator right now. Um, and you're able to hold your own and communicate and be clear. Um, now, there may be others with your experience who haven't managed to get through. Maybe you have just this gift of communicating. We all have a gift of communicating. That's why we're on this forum. Um, whilst you say, I wouldn't worry about that if you don't hold that uh, as part of the skill set, isn't it a reality that people around us who are not part of this movement judge people on that basis? You know, smart guy, well, don't put him in front of the camera, God forbid. Um, tell us a bit about that. I'm touching on an important point because it is out there. It is a, it is a bias. Yep. Um, yes, no, it, it's certainly true. I think maybe the question that I have to those who are tuning in is maybe if you could cite the examples of the three women who co-founded Black Lives Matter and whether or not you identify them in the same kind of category as an Obama or a Malcolm X or a Gandhi, for example. I think that's a 20th century, maybe early 21st mm. century rendition of what creates changes. You need to mm. be that person who can mobilize people through the radio mm. waves and, and, and mm. get people mobilized in that way. I also think at the same time, like it's, it's okay not to be the quarterback. I think each person has their role in, in the game. And, and I, I don't have to be the one who's really the star. Uh, I can also be the person who's in defense. I could be mm -hmm. the person who's mm -hmm. at, at that midline, for example. And that's also yeah. a humility exercise too for people who create change. That's because a good point. there are thousands yeah. of people who have lived experience within a particular mm -hmm. pocket of work. Who's going yep. to be the orator? Who's going to be right. the one in the process work? Who's going? They, they, that humility assessment also comes there too. Yeah, it yeah. reminds me of Mark, when Mark Devine talked about in our previous show when it's the new leader is the team. Yes. Yeah. Right. The new leader is the team, and how do we each you know play our parts in that? Um, that's a great example of that.
I want to remind the audience, this is a great time to put in your mm -hmm. questions. We want to make sure that we get them to Abdullahi. We actually have one I want to ask you right now, just in a very simple way. Um, one of our participants uh, on the call right now is asking, when you talk about youth and youth movement, could you define that a little more clearly? Like what's actually the bracket you're talking about just to have a little more context when you talk about youth? I, I say under 35, but also I think the bounds could be under 40 in some parts of the world too. Uh, just, just the reality, mm -hmm. again, some parts of the world, you really only have the privilege to start thinking of these conversations a bit later. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that age bound somewhat varies. At the same time, I also don't think there's a lower bound to mm -hmm. it. So it could be the 16 year old, it could increasingly get younger. And mm -hmm. I also think that's fine too. But I think of that bound, the 18, let's say to 35, as mm -hmm. being the common of today's, today's kind of day. Mm -hmm. And also noting that there is intergenerational discrepancy within that bound too. Okay. So Af, I don't think we made the cuts. I don't think we made the cuts, Af. Uh <laughs> That's helpful. We need to change. We need to change the. We need to change the <laughs> demographics, mate. <laughs> so, here, here's an important question for you that I was thinking of: is what what happens when? I mean, we talk a lot about inspired youth and people who are responding to the moment. <clears throat> How? What happens when you deal with youth that are apathetic, that don't give a shit, that are just tuned out? How mm. do you try to reach them, or do you try, or what's your approach or philosophy when you have peers and colleagues that are just not tuned in? I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't, again, I don't think everyone has to be the quarterback. I don't right. think everyone has to be the star of their generation. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not a detractor, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's really the main issue, which I think is where that generational tension sometimes mm -hmm. comes when it's somebody mm -hmm. who's a bit older, more experienced, and because sometimes you know they're shocked at maybe the bravado or confidence of a younger person, mm -hmm. feel the need to kind of like chop it a bit. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not seeing that within your own age group, Mm -hmm. As long as we're not undermining the work of mm -hmm. others, I think that's fine because everyone comes to it on their own kind of learning and their mm -hmm. own journey as well. But um, I also believe, you know, we know where young people consume their information. Mm -hmm. We also know where they mm -hmm. engage most prominently. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can guarantee you probably half of those who put Blackout Tuesday earlier this year would not have even thought to use the hashtag last year um, mm -hmm. in my demographic, in, mm -hmm. the, in the youth bucket. I can't lay that against them as to where they were last year versus where they are now. I always just think it's best to just keep doing the work that you are doing and the right allies and the right kind of supporters will come, will come on the bandwagon. Now, mm. they're also the beneficiary, the, those who are within our generation mm. too. So can I truly expect the beneficiary who's usually the one who's somewhat disadvantaged to also be doing all the heavy lifting too? Not necessarily. I think it requires a bit of superhuman abilities, which comes from, some parts of any generation. Mm -hmm. And, and Abdullah, five years out, you're doing this amazing work right now, which both Rick and I, of course, and the audience is um, uh, plugged into. We, we, seem to, we, we believe in it, we're committed to it, and that's why we set up this not-for-profit ourselves. So we should talk about how we can work more together. That's a separate thing. But t tell us a little bit about, for someone like you, five years out, what, what happens to you? What, when you look back five years out, whatever age you're gonna be then, um, and you look back and you look, you're almost looking back at yourself five years out. Where, where do you see yourself being? What impact have you made? Uh, what, what things have you changed within yourself or around you? What would make you feel content? Thank you for asking that. I, I think for me, I, I'm at a point now where I measure my five year or whatever kind of a age outlook based on just how informed I am of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the issues of the world, whether that's business challenges, social challenges, economic, whatever, whatever the examples are. I, I don't necessarily marry my expectations to like deliverables as such. I think that will naturally come because I think that is anxiety inducing. <laughs> I think, I, I don't think that's something that I necessarily want to have in my life. Um, I hope I have greater inner peace. I hope I have a greater understanding of the world. Um, I hope the science to movements becomes a lot more structured in the way in which I'm able to articulate that too. And I hope I'm able to understand more about the economics of social justice work. Mm -hmm. I think I see a lot of youth movements today about racial equity or mm. the rights of minorities. I see things about the climate too. I want to see economic justice as a movement. Mm. I want to mm. see us tackle the fact that after every 10 years we have a depression. After mm -hmm. every 10 years, 
the people who suffered the most from that last generation now have to deal with austerity measures. Mm. And, and it's literally on their backs to, mm. to bring things back to normal. I want to see corrective economic justice as a youth movement and mm. one that's global. Um, and I, I'm hoping to learn more about the world, maybe in this organization or anywhere else to get me closer to that understanding. Mm. I appreciate your perspective on that and how not just locking in on the objectives, but what are, what's the mindset and behavior and, and who, I, who do I want to be? Not just necessarily those, you know, locked in um, objectives, as we said. So I appreciate that. Uh, one question, we talked a little bit about allyship and I want to go a little deeper in that from one of our questions from Fatima Zara. Uh, she asks, what advice can you give young people on ways to start building allyship? And what are, in your opinion, criteria of a solid allyship? Mm. For me, trust and loyalty are the most important currency of any allyship-based uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to, to build it is to know that, you know, there is a power dis discrepancy from the very beginning. They usually have more power than the younger generation. Mm. So there is a bit of, you need to show and, and kind of like gain their trust mm -hmm. in the beginning, whether that means... I don't know, helping them on something or working on, with them on something, of course, within a values-based framework. Um, and I think that conversation naturally has to be based on like some kind of honesty from our end too, to say, this is what I'd like to see. This is what I'd like to do. I think what you've done so far as X, Y, Z is so mm -hmm. important and I want to learn from it. Of course, in a far more natural way. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have that kind of, relationship it usually comes out naturally because i i think most people would be surprised to know that a lot of people want to mentor young people mm -hmm. i mean like it's it's just the norm a lot of people do want to help it's not mm -hmm. it's not within our nature to say to give a middle finger to somebody who's trying to do good you know right but i think yes there are sometimes preconceived ideas so sometimes it's a case where you just need to build that trusted relationship mm -hmm. it could take a year or two let's see and I think from there, you build conversations where you discuss your own ambitions and just how much you want to learn from the other person. And I think naturally it shows up from there. But I think the most important criteria for one is trust and loyalty. Mm. Do, you, do you think cross, I mean, your experience again, do you, do you see the variances or factors that affect what you've just said, which is we should two very important things, trust and loyalty in any relationship, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually. Um, but do you see any differences when it comes to high tr what I refer to as high trust, low trust economies? Um, there are some economies that are well baked, more um, established. There's more social justice, uh, more maybe, maybe democracy and the political regime has something to do with it. Uh, rule of law, uh, yeah. healthcare, education, all those things. Do you see these factors um, do the same thing as as consistent in a in a in a country or a region that is a low trust country the youth and the potential allies uh is the, are the rules still the same because you know um i speak from personal experience that it's not always like that but what's your view i think the currency is even more pronounced the need to have trust and loyalty mm. is even much stronger in those scenarios mm -hmm. i also think there's an informal language in how you communicate sometimes yeah. because it's not the case that you come into a power space and just like i need to change this and i didn't need to change that because that signals a lot of immaturity and sometimes scares people as well because they're very aware of the kind of context they operate in i think it comes from informal cues mm -hmm. um and I, I don't know how to necessarily explain that but it, it's 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 in the subtlety of of how you present work how you communicate ideas how you share your ideas whether you do them in private versus public i think there's an informal language there entirely that determines the strength of that allyship because people really, really need that trust and loyalty even more for them to really open up themselves mm. to share in these high trust, low trust kind of uh, discrepancies. Could you give an example or, or two of what that could look like to have that subtlety that you're talking about? Mm. Mm. I'm trying to think of a non-political one <laughs> uh, for, from my example. And we're okay with political too. Okay, let's talk. Okay, I'm not going to name the country. Let's okay. just talk about public corruption as the, as, as the issue. Hmm. If you are the young person who's trying to learn from somebody who's very aware of that, I, I'd be hmm. perplexed to understand why a young person might bring that up on their first conversation. I think that literally comes hmm. up almost a year down the track. I see. You know? mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's completely based on just the idea of building that trusted relationship. You do not politicize relations. 
You do not use your social media platform mm. as, a, as an avenue to communicate that. Mm. You do not share information, even as low uh, value as it might seem to anyone outside that person. Mm. That trust and loyalty currency is so much more pronounced. Mm. I would say in the global South predominantly. And people really, really need to see that mm -hmm. uh, and really need to be able to, 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 to yeah, really see that in us before they're able to kind of present that information forward. So I always say, think of what that means in your workplace. Does it mean going above and beyond what you're normally doing? Does it, which you could be, right. does it also mean trying to align yourself to, <clears throat> to a particular individual? Maybe it's doing the same extracurricular. I, I, it, it's really just the typical way of building that relationship, right? But, mm -hmm. but there will become very intricate moments where your subject matter comes up. So let's say it's on corruption mm -hmm. and how you communicate back to that person will be the deciding factor. Cause at that point I'd imagine you build trust. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you say, you know, we need to fix this or we need to do that or whether you say, you know, something that makes the challenge a little bit more practical to solve. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe deflecting to the positive examples. Like there, there are very informal cues that you can give to suggest that you are also as guarded because you are aware of the context in which you operate as the person, or the other person is too. Hmm. I think the more you give those cues, the more people can trust you. That has mm -hmm. also been my experience also dealing with young people who are from, let's say, fragile states. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm based in another country. I, I could be many things that they aren't even aware of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that trusted relationship is something that I have to put as much energy in. Mm -hmm. um, and they, on their side too, in order for me to really be able to have that relationship with them as well. So really, really, I think that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that point. It's, it's such an important piece to understand the importance of that trust and loyalty currency mm -hmm. before you can build any meaningful allyship. Hmm. And, I, and I think trust, trust and relationship is a very important word here because relationships aren't, uh, what we mean by relationships being facetious about this is not the Facebook friend that you have out of nowhere who you just click uh, yes, accept yes. requests from. Relationships take time. Mm -hmm. um, they go through ups and downs, like a marriage, like a very deep friendship. And I think it's a two way street. You know, it, the, it has to be equitable. Mm -hmm. It has to, eventually there has to be some sort of a balance where I trust you because I shared um, everything with you. And you trust me because I kept all the secrets that you told me about. Right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the binary aspects of human human dynamics, which through media, social media, I find sometimes has just evaporated, got lost. We yep. almost behave like AI bots ourselves sometimes. So I think thank you for bringing that back mm -hmm. to uh, to us because generationally, I do see the younger generation under thirty five. We're out of it. Um, you know, talking more and more about the challenges with relationship and trust more and more. And I think there is this temptation to use Snapchat or any of the social media platforms, whatever it may be, TikTok or anything, and just vomit out that emotion, spill out that emotion. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's supposed to be good for you. And yeah. the problem with that is that right. it has some, it has some dangers and negatives because yeah. sometimes you spill out, not realizing it's something that was quite sacred right. to the bond and the relationship you had, trust and loyalty mm -hmm. with that person at that agency. And that's now, yeah gone yeah, and true. these are the nuances i think you're kind of referring to very true, very true. Um, yeah. and i would actually i would put in a point around patience abdullahi i'm sure you were meant to say it, you were going to say it because young young people including myself i'm you know even my generation very bloody impatient and i think you have to have a patient a sense of patience in a relationship to say like you said not now now is not the time to discuss that issue although it's burning you've got to yeah, wait yeah. and build that trust so um, yeah, and no, that's a wonderful, wonderful point. Thank you for that. Can I just add to that? There are yeah. conversations or relationships that I have with, uh, with, let's say, friends who I'd love to learn more about their own experiences that mm. I haven't asked three years into the friendship mm. because yeah. I still don't feel like I'm at a stage where, mm. I mean, they live in very hostile parts of the world where I feel mm. like I, they can trust me enough to share that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's the case with every relationship. It's very true. Mm. So you have to always be conscious of how much you are your public self is, is, is speaking because mm -hmm. that also becomes a reflection of your, your, your real self as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, really good point. Amazing. And, and we are coming to the end of our show here. Um, Abdullahi, we want to give you last words. Anything that you want to say to our audience in particular on this topic of youth and systemic reform? Yeah, I think um, in today's world, you have a lot of examples of people like 
of Malala, of people like Greta, of people like uh, just the Fridays for Future movement. And, and there are many examples of that in different parts of the world. And I think that sometimes gives the impression to people that young people are self-organizing and, and creating that systemic impact mm -hmm. and, 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 and also hold power in society. I think sometimes we, it, it negates just how powerless young people are to start mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and the context that really gives rise to that. This mm. is the first generation to live through two economic crises within their millennial years. That mm. makes it that much harder for them to get their first job, their first yep. internship, to sustain full-time work. And they're a greater reliance on these gig economy style mm. roles, which have very few labor rights. Um, it's, it's, it's the last generation that could do anything about the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, again, the first, first generation to be poorer than their parents. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of landmark moments happening within this particular generation and mm -hmm. i think for anybody watching this please give yourself a chance to understand those structural inequities mm -hmm. whether you are a young person or whether you are a potential ally from another generation understand that because i think then we realize just the scale of the challenge mm -hmm. i think if you are particularly a young person and you want to create change do not be betrayed by your epiphany that tells you and awakens you to the the, the need to create change you mm -hmm. are never the first I wasn't the first, nobody on this call is ever really the first to want to create change. Mm. Many people have tried, many people have had great intentions and great ideas and have come short. Study your history, study your activism, put time mm. into diagnosis. Um, and also last, I think it's a lifelong lesson. Patience was just a term used. You, there is nothing that tells you that you need to create change by an arbitrary age of 30. There is no reason for you to be on every single award platform mm -hmm. by 30, right. for example, too. These are externalities that you mm -hmm. can choose to internalize or not. So always, always, always think of it in the long run. Always, always remember you will always outlast any activism you wish to do. So prioritize mm -hmm. yourself and your own well-being. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And always remember there are allies. There are those who want to co-opt you. <laughs> there are those who will be your detractors. Mm -hmm. And knowing and being able to spot that will be your lifelong kind of learning too. Mm. Abdullahi, thank you so much for being on our show today. Your wisdom, your humbleness, your passion. Um, I just really appreciate the energy that you bring forth and the clarity. So um, how can people find out more about you if they want to learn more about what you're up to? Where, where should they go? Thank you. I, I wish I could say a website. I am on social media at Abdullahi Alim. So just... I say Abdullahi as it's the most commonly spelt name. So A B D U W L A H I Alim A L I M, and I'm I'm on that username across social media. So please look for Abdullahi Alim, and then also on our page at StreetTalk.live, you'll see his profile there on our speakers page as well. Um, so thank you once again. Amazing to have your energy. And um, Af, you want to say any final words there too? Uh, no, I think what, what a wonderful show. Thank you for sharing um, all of those amazing words and experiences. Um, it's got, got us thinking. Uh, that's the whole point of mm -hmm. Straight Talks Out Live. And this was a straight talk. And we need to have more straight talks with you as you go through your experiences mm -hmm. and your thesis and your investigations, because it's not, it doesn't stop at one one hour chat. Yeah. It's just an introduction to what you're doing. The real change will come when you unpack what you're learning. Yes. And then we have time to reconsider a lot of what we're doing already. We would love to partner with you with on Straight Talk Live. We have a community of many, many speakers, world change makers. Um, let's support your mission because it mm -hmm. keeps us in the game. It keeps us very focused on our sense of purpose. So thank you for coming on today, uh, Abdullahi. And uh, we wish you all the best in everything you're going to do. Thank you very much. And then really quick, um, our, next, our show next week actually is related to this topic on some level around economic reform, but looking at more of the digital technology side of that conversation with Robert Jameson, Group Chief Digital Officer of Legal and General. So how do you actually have inclusive capitalism? Is that an oxymoron? Can, that, can technology help? How does that work? Stay tuned next week, same time. Thank you all Straight Talk Livers out there. Now go start straight talking with those around you. Okay, be well, everyone. Over and out.